Your home with Build Aid on Mix 93.8. Proudly brought to you by AfriSam. AfriSam, creating concrete possibilities. Build Aid on Mix 93.8 FM. Good evening. My name's Graham Alexander. In the studio as usual, K. But we're missing Simon. But we have Kwang. He's our program manager at Mix FM looking after the works this evening. I'm going to be chatting to Brett Cohen from the gas company talking about gas in your home. Yeah, and just a little update on last week. All of you musos out there who contributed to our song on Josie, I got the first draft of the song today, and it's pretty cool. We're going to be launching it probably next week, Wednesday, on the Bish and Fish show and um, interviewing Naming James about it. We had about 50 songwriters last week, <laughs> and I hope you put them all on the cassette or on the back of the... I've got a record of everybody's name, and we had some amazing lyrics coming through too, and of course three of you won some of this amazing mortar ice cream, and that's been delivered already. So tonight you can also win some ice cream. I'm going to tell you three things about three different rock stars, and you need to tell me which one is true. Two of them are lies, and one of them is the truth. So here's the first one. Phil Collins, when he was a teenager, his friend drowned, and there was a guy standing next to him who didn't help. And when he launched his song in the air tonight, he gave this guy tickets to his show and then highlighted that you know he knew he was guilty. The second one is Ozzy Osbourne, lead singer of Black Sabbath, ate the head of a live bat during a concert. And the third one is Gene Simmons of KISS had doctors surgically attach a cow tongue to his mouth. Which one's true? SMS us on 41348. Build Aid on Mix. My name's Graham Alexander. And in the studio this evening, Brett Cohen from the gas company. Brett, thanks so much for coming to chat to us. Yeah, cheers. Thanks, Graham. It's good to be here. Fantastic. Um, an interesting subject, um, Brett. And I think gas is something that a lot of us have got more used to. Over the, over the last sort of five, ten years, um, particularly in areas like Waterfall Estate and so on, where they have piped gas into, into, their, into their estate. So we're going to have a bit of fun tonight listening to, to your knowledge. Um, we're also going to have you back in a few weeks talking about a subject that I'm really looking forward to. So we'll do a bit of a preview on that as well. But Brett, your company goes back to 1947. Um, tell me a little bit about it. Yeah, quite right. We, uh, my granddad actually started it. In, my granddad actually started it in, uh, in uh, Church Street in Pretoria originally. It was called Berman Brothers. It was a very different setup. They were electrical mer- merchants. They sold uh, retail electrical equipment. Um, gas as a, as a controlled sort of regulated industry started off in South Africa in the early 1960s, um, and they got on board relatively quickly then already. Okay. Um, so it's third generation. Uh, my dad was running it for a while. He's retired, living on a farm. Um, now it's my turn. And is it your turn to go to a farm one day? <laughs> yeah, probably. It, that'd be good. <laughs> is he on a game farm or a sort of like a, a cow farm? He's, he's got a cow farm that he's busy converting into a game farm. So <laughs> I don't know. Cows don't seem to be mad about that, but we'll see how it ends up. <laughs> Great stuff. Um, Brett, where does gas come from? How is it made? Um, and how do we get it from wherever it is to our homes? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, gas is in South Africa mostly refined, um, so we fetch it out of the earth. Um, it's a byproduct of uh, some of the petroleum processes, um, and then it gets uh, it gets uh, put into into um, storage, and you can pick it up at the refineries and distribute it through that channel. Um, some of it also comes. We've got a, a gas line coming from Mozambique down to to Cecil. Um, and they can convert some of the, the natural gas that flows down that line into LPG if they need to or into other byproducts, other, other petroleum products. Um, and then, of course, like, demand's really increased in South Africa, so we're starting to see a lot of imports starting to come now, in. LPG, what does that stand for? Liquid petroleum gas. Okay. Yeah. And that's the gas we're chatting about tonight? Correct. Not natural gas Not that's natural piped gas. in from… 100%. Okay. So, so natural gas is a very different monster. It has some of the same properties, um, but it's not quite the same thing. Uh, LPG um, is liquid petroleum gas. Like I said, it's a mixture of propane and butane, um, and the two gases to give, together give you a really good burning, um, burning fuel source. The question is: It dangerous? I suppose it's like asking if anything's dangerous. It, it's, it could be if you don't know what to do with it. Yeah, it's, look, but you, but I think there's, there's, there are concerns that gas can be dangerous. Hundred percent. And uh, look, you, you know, uh, you need to respect gas just like you need to respect electricity or any other fuel source, really. Um, it's bottled energy, and it's a lot of energy that you put in a bottle. So you need to know the rules, understand. There's a, there's a lot of regulations that are worked out to make it uh, to make it safe, um, and you follow those guidelines, and you'll be fine. It's a it's a really safe energy source, and for certain, 
certain use cases for certain purposes it's really really effective yeah Graham Alexander chatting to Brett Cohen from the gas company. Brett, back to geysers, so we understand what a what a gas geyser is and and what it does. Um, I think a lot of people think there's a, a, a water tank somewhere. Right. Just give us a, a quick specification on on what it is and how it works. All right. So probably the biggest difference is exactly that uh, uh, um, a gas geyser is typically an instantaneous geyser. So you turn on the tap, water flows through the geyser instantly gets heated up and comes out on the other side hot. There's no storage of the of the water. There's no concern about how much water is available. So you'll have hot water as long as you have gas. Um, what it does, it changes the dynamic of trying to work out how big a geyser you need for your house. Because we've all grown up with, uh, with the old donkey that you had in the ceiling that, uh, that was really inefficient but worked quite well. It stores a whole lot of water. As long as what everybody plays nicely and stays in the shower for the right amount of time, the whole family can... can uh, can shower before it runs out and then you've got a relatively quick two or three hour recovery time and then you can shower again um, and it's warm again. The, the gas geyser works completely differently. So the water comes in, gets heated up, comes out the other side hot. So your question doesn't become how much do I need to store or how big does this, how many liters can, uh, can this thing, what's the capacity of the, of the geyser? The question becomes, right, how many liters of hot water can this thing deliver instantaneously? Um, and that's how they get measured. So they start at like five or six liters per minute for a camping geyser outside, and they go all the way up to, say, 30 or 32 liters per minute for some of the top-end uh, units. They can also be banked. So in industrial settings, we can deliver thousands of liters of hot water instantaneously as what you need it. Typically, uh, uh, a gym would do that, where you have this high peak demand early in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, lots of people are showering, um, and then during the day there's a lull, nobody uses anything, and then in the evening it switches on, you have to supply a peak demand again. Um, so that would be a really good uh, a, a yeah. use case for that sort of thing. Um, Brett, a geezer sounds like a fairly c- complex uh, um, thing. You know, it's mechanical, it's yeah. electronic, and so on. So quality must be be a factor when you're buying something like a, a gas geezer. Yeah, 100%. The, the thing with the, with the gas geezer, over and above sort of the technical components and the size and all of that, is that it, it supplies your household with hot water. And uh, if you're in a crisis in the household, you run out of hot water because there's just pressure from every side. So you really you want to you want to uh, you want to get on with a team that's going to sort you out if you do have those sort of problems. So it's not a place you want to cut costs for your for your um, for your main supply of hot water, you know. Um, but horses for courses, you know. If you're gonna if you're gonna have a spare room, maybe, um, and people come visit once a month, you can put in a, a, a sort of a, a lower spec unit than uh, than what you typically put in your main on suite. So a bit of advice could be check the price, do your average sort of price sure. um, and make a choice and I would make the choice based on brand and supplier. Right. And if somebody's 20, 30% below that, you need to ask why. Yeah, generally you need to raise your eyebrows at that and just do a little bit of research on, on yeah. your sort of where's, where, where's the value coming. Um, where's the discount built in? Okay, we have a question that's come in. Yes, we do. It says, um, I live in an area with a very high lime content in the water. Will a gas geyser work? Yes. In a way, <laughs> it will. It will. Here we um, go. It, uh, look, it, it, what, what could potentially happen, a, a gas geyser obviously has a, a, a flame, um, and then it has effectively like a car's radiator in reverse, which pushes the water through this, uh, this uh, combustion area. Um, and it comes out hot on the other side. Now, obviously, if you've got a lot of uh, lime in the water, what could potentially happen is that that piping could start to build up um, with lime, and it'll start flaking eventually. There are filters in the units, um, so the lime shouldn't make its way into your taps and that sort of stuff. Um, and what you can do is, if after a couple of years, it'll be many years, but if after a couple of years it starts to um, starts to calcify to the extent where you, you're seeing that the, the pressure's reducing in your unit, it's a very simple process. The, those, uh, those radiators that I spoke of are all made out of copper. You disconnect the copper areas and you just run a bit of, uh, a bit of hydrochloric acid through the unit, uh, wash it out again, connect it up again, you're good to go. So there's no problem at all. There you go. Shortages. And and preparing for for winter. Yeah, is this is this something that one needs to be really aware of? I think I think we need to we need to get wiser about it as South Africans. Um, I think that uh, as we stand at the moment, um, demand outstrips supply in South Africa. So what we can manufacture in South Africa is less than what we need in the winter months. So in the summer months we're fine. In the winter months there's a lot more demand for gas. We're not getting enough gas distributed through the country. Um, so it puts pressure on everybody. And what, what happens is once one of the refineries find themselves under pressure, that pressure just banks up. When we, when we look at people that have got 
two bottles. <laughs> we laughed earlier that they're probably both going to be empty <laughs> soon. But there's probably one in the garage and there's sure. one in your gas heater that you haven't used for two years and so on. Right. There must be millions of rands with the bottles out there. There are lots of bottles out there. Um, and uh, now's a good time, like just before the winter, because the winter's coming. It's, it's already it's dark in the mornings. It's starting to get chilly in the evenings. It's a good time to start uh, getting your bottles in, getting them refilled. Gas price nice and cheap at the moment. So, um, that works in your favor. Um, and get your bottles filled up and you start building a little bit of storage for the winter for just in case. Um, I think every household should have, if you're using gas, have at least one spare bottle. Yeah. Um, Brett, we've, we've run out of time, unfortunately, but that's cool because I know we're going to be talking to you again in the next few weeks, um, particularly about these gas bottles and rogue suppliers. But I also want to go through some of the pricing of different um, installations. But it's going to have to wait, folks, um, and we'll be chatting to, to um, Brett again in the very near future. Brett, thanks so much for coming to chat to us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. We do this every Wednesday between 6 and 7. Up next is Adam Ford Cortina and Motoring in the Mix. Chat to you next week. Ciao. Your home with BuildAid on Mix brings you all sorts of interesting info about building. Graham Alexander chats to different guests every Wednesday evening between 6 and 7. Proudly brought to you by AfriSam. AfriSam, creating concrete possibilities.